Welcome to today's podcast. Our topic today is five types of people who can ruin your life with high conflict divorce expert, Bill Eddy. I'm Rebecca Zung. And I'm Susan Guthrie. So today's guest is very, very special. We have received numerous requests from you, our listeners, to do more shows dealing with the topic of getting divorced from, um, from high conflict personalities or dealing with people who have personality disorders like narcissists or people suffering from borderline personality disorder. So today we are absolutely honored to have with us one of the top experts in the world on this topic, attorney, therapist, and author, Bill Eddy. Um, so just to give you a little background on Bill, so you understand just the wealth of knowledge that, that Bill has in this area, Bill and Megan Hunter, um, who many of you probably remember from our episode number 104, um, which was entitled uh, Dealing with High Conflict Personalities in Divorce, Bill and Megan founded the High Conflict Institute. And Bill is what I call the trifecta of professionals. Um, he has the professional backgrounds that make him perfect for the family law field. He's a therapist, an attorney, and a mediator. Um, and he developed the high conflict personality theory. So really, he's the, the central expert in this area. Um, and most importantly, for those of you who are listening, Bill is a prolific author. He has written many, many books on the topic. Um, you have heard us mention them in a number of our previous episodes because they really are a lifeline for you if you are going through a divorce or a separation or just dealing with someone in a high conflict situation. Um, I just want to mention a couple of the titles. You've heard us mention them before. Um, one of my favorites, Biff. I order this book by the box load and keep it in my office. And I tell my clients all the time, you need to Biff your ex. You need to you know, use the Biff method to keep your communication with your high conflict ex uh, under control. There's also splitting, which is kind of my Bible, um, also recommended all the time for clients for protecting yourself when you are divorcing a narcissist or a person with borderline personality disorder. And then there are, you know, there are many other books, but um, another title I love is It's All Your Fault, <laughs> which is about managing those who blame others. And then central to today's conversation is five types of people who can ruin your life. Um, so there, this is such an important topic that Bill has agreed to stay with us a little longer than normal. And we're going to be breaking this down into two separate episodes so that we can bring you our first ever two-parter and give you more of the benefit of Bill's wealth of knowledge in this area. So Bill, really, it's an honor to have you here today. And thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you so much, Susan and Rebecca. I'm really pleased to be on your program. And I feel like people need this information so much. I'm happy to talk as long as you want me to. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Bill. I, we, um, I especially also want to thank you myself. Um, I have to tell you a funny story. I was uh, representing a couple, or, or husband, and um, the wife was on the other side. And, and the two of them had such a high conflict divorce that the judge had decided to make us come once a month for a case management conference so she could check in to see how they were doing. And at one point, she actually um, required them to read your book. She went back to her chambers, got the Biff book, <laughs> gave them each a copy, and told them she wanted, to do, she wanted them to do a book report on it. And they had to come back the next month reporting on what they learned from the Biff book. So <laughs> I love that. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah. So and, and I also have to say, I, I wrote a book called Breaking Free, hence the name of this podcast. And um, I, I'm so honored always when my when people look at my book on Amazon, it says often purchased with and your book splitting is usually the one that comes up with my book. And I'm always like, wow, I'm in great company. <laughs> so 
I, uh, I've often, often, often recommended your book, Splitting, for people who are dealing with high conflict personalities. Um, the buzzword today is narcissist. Um, mm -hmm. You know, many people feel that they are in a relationship with a narcissist, and uh, that's such a great, great resource. So I'm, I'm so excited to have you here myself today as well. So I have to say the, the term high conflict personality is one of those things that you hear a lot. If you're going through divorce, you always almost feel like your spouse is a high conflict personality. But, um, you know, whether they actually are a narcissist or a high conflict personality, maybe just a perception because they're dealing with a divorce, right? So um, what are your thoughts as to what actually is a high conflict personality versus just a regular divorcing personality? Okay. Well, this is, this is a very important topic, so I'm glad you asked that. Really, think in terms of a continuum that people have more or less difficulty. And in terms of high conflict personality, what it really boils down to from what I've seen, and I speak around the world and it's the same everywhere, is basically four characteristics. One is a preoccupation with blaming other people and not taking responsibility themselves. Second really is a lot of all or nothing thinking. This person's all bad, I'm all good. The solution is you go away and I have the kids 100% of the time or I have the house and the money, I get 100% of everything. It's that kind of all or nothing thinking. Then thirdly is unmanaged emotions. And for some people, this is yelling, screaming, throwing things, punching a hole in the wall, uh, storming out of court during their own hearing. Uh, I teach judges and I say, how many have had someone storm out of the courtroom during their own hearing? <laughs> and half the judges usually raise their hand. And one time, one of the judges said, the other half are new. <laughs> and had this happen yet. So there's unmanaged emotions. But some people don't show that as dramatically. They may be very controlled, but their emotions take them off course. And they're busy reacting, 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 rather than planning what to do. And the fourth is extreme behavior, that they do things that sometimes 90% of people would never do um, in terms of causing a scene somewhere, in terms of spreading really vicious rumors on the internet, uh, a variety of things. Of course, domestic violence, uh, hiding money, hiding children, all of that. So at the extreme is really, you know, we, we see that pattern at the extreme in, in the worst cases, but people often feel like that's happening and see it first in the other party uh, before they see it in themselves. So this is high conflict personalities. Now let me talk briefly about personality disorders. Narcissist is a personality disorder. Again, it's on a continuum. How extreme does it get? And the key point is when does the person stop looking at themselves? And so if you have someone who seems kind of self-centered or preoccupied with themselves, doesn't mean they have a personality disorder. Personality disorder comes when they don't look at themselves. They can only see other people's responsibility and problems, and they don't change anything. And so when there's a high conflict dispute, there may be one or two people who aren't changing at all, and that just keeps it going. And from what I've seen, high conflict cases, about half of them are one reasonable person and one high conflict personality. But the other half tend to be two high conflict personalities who just can't look at their own part in the problem. So yeah, those are the ones that end up in trial. <laughs> yes, yes. Over and over again. Yes. I, I used to say when I wrote my first book about all of this, that, that half of trials were really more about personality issues than legal issues. Oh, absolutely. 
And I, I started saying that to judges because I was asked to speak to judges. And they said, Bill, you've got it wrong. And I'm thinking, oh, I overestimated. They said, no, Bill, it's 70% <laughs> personality-based problems. So the key, and, and your listeners should know this, if you can ask yourself these two questions on a regular basis, you don't have a high conflict personality and you don't have a personality disorder. The two questions are, what's my part in this problem, whatever it is today, and what could I do differently in the future? Even if it's not really my fault, it's mostly the other person, always be looking at what can I do different? How can I have a different strategy? And I always ask myself that, even when things go badly that I really think have nothing to do with me, I still need to look at what could I try next time so that I'm better able to manage the situation. So, so if you hear those two questions, like the Charlie Brown, want, 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 that means that you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And well, I think that's so important, though, because everyone, especially when uh, we hear from listeners, they're very focused on the behaviors of their ex, right, but you right. rarely hear anything about their own participation in what's going on. And I don't know that it's that there's any awareness around that they, there might be some role on the part of um, both sides in that ongoing conflict. Yeah, and even if it really is mostly what's happening by the other person, we still need to look at what could we try doing differently, that that's the key. The, the key is being able to take responsibility for your own behavior in some way. Exactly. And then these, these high conflict personality people are just not willing to do that. No. no. And what's great to me is I'll give a seminar or something and someone will come up after and say, you know, I'm kind of worried. I might have a personality disorder. You describe characteristics that I have. Sometimes I have mood swings and sometimes I'm self-centered. And they say, so you're looking at yourself and you're concerned. Yeah. And you're thinking of changing some of what you do. Yeah. Then you don't have a personality <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, I had to laugh when you said you couldn't, and people who can't control their behavior. I had a client one time, my client, his wife was testifying on the stand, and he's sitting next to me at counsel table, and she, he yells out, that's a lie, right in the <laughs> middle of the hearing. And I'm looking at him like, could you uh, shut your mouth? Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's the unmanaged emotions part. Yes. Exactly. And, and it, it unfortunately demonstrates the opposite of what they're trying to say. You know, so I'm the more responsible person. Then why can't you kind of hold your tongue? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I think that's um, one of the things that's so helpful. I, I, I loved five types of people who will ruin your life. Um, I just read it again um, in getting ready to, to speak with you today. And you always have, you know, helpful tips for how, if you are in the situation of dealing with a high conflict personality or a person with a personality disorder, you have tips, actual actionable tips for people to follow through so that they can get through this. But the first thing that you, you um, point out in the book is something called the web method for identifying whether or not you're actually dealing with a high conflict behavior. Um, and I thought, you know, I love your acronyms like BIF um, or EAR, which, which you may talk about today, um, but they're wonderful because they really do help people sort of hone in on the action steps or, or how to break this all down because it feels so overwhelming when you are going through it. I can say that as a divorce attorney, I, re, I still vividly remember my first case where I had a, high, a, a person with what I presume is a personality disorder involved. And I had no idea what was going on. It was crazy making. Um, and that's, you know, so could you describe the web method for our listeners? Yeah. And it's, it's basic, it's very simple. It's words, their words. Pay attention to, do they use words that have a lot of all or nothing in them? You always do this. You never do that. Those kind of commonly used words. And I want to mention, everybody does that occasionally. But if they have a pattern, of doing that. Um, blaming, of course, preoccupied with blaming others. If you, if you hear and read blame, blame, blame without any uh, responsibility, 
person saying, here's what I need to do now, here's what I'd like you to do. Uh, so the words that they use. Now the words may be extremely negative or they may be extremely positive. And so even when people are dating, I suggest that they pay attention to the word. You know, you're the, the smartest person I've ever met, or you're the most beautiful person in the world, or, you know, you've swept me off my feet. No one has ever done this before. And, and you get the feeling that there's an extreme aspect to it, that those extreme wonderful or extreme terrible words are often a warning sign. So that's their words. Now the E is your emotions. And this is what's really interesting is how you feel can actually give you a tip as to who you're dealing with. And I'll give you one of the best examples that I have. That is one day I was driving home from work from my law office and I was really feeling stupid and incompetent. And I was saying, you know, I'm not very good at this. And then I thought, wait a minute, did I have a narcissist in my caseload today? And I worked back, yes, 10 o'clock, I interviewed a new client and they're very narcissistic. Because when you're around a narcissist, they're known for sucking all the air out of the room and they also have to put everybody else down. And so when you're around a narcissist, you start feeling stupid and inadequate and incompetent and things like that because they're putting that out. So when you're feeling that way, and, and I get this a lot, people when they're separating or divorcing from a narcissist, they say, I, I started to feel so inadequate um, and self-critical. I always just felt like I'm doing something wrong. And it's that how you feel, but also with some of the others, uh, an antisocial personality, which is another one of the five, if you feel a little bit in danger, you feel mm, this kind of cold and creepy feeling, even though the person says wonderful words, that may be a sign. So your emotions. Um, with someone who may have, say, borderline personality traits, is you just feel so frustrated, you know, you want to shake them or something like that. That tells you maybe you're dealing with someone with that personality type. Uh, anyway, and then B is their behavior. And I, I came upon this about a year before writing Five Types of People. What I realized is I used to say you need to see a pattern of behavior over time because these are patterns of behavior, the high conflict behavior. But then I realized I often dealt with people who had done one thing that was so extreme if they had an excuse for it, you know, I was tired or uh, I was stressed or, you know, when you go through a divorce, you do extreme things. No, not everybody does the most extreme things, even when they're going through a divorce. So I started realizing and kind of looking at it, it was about if 90% if of people would never do this behavior, even if they were tired, even if they were stressed, then you may be looking at someone with a pattern of high conflict behavior underneath. So that's what I would say is if their behavior, they do some things that 90% of people would never do, spreading rumors, hiding money, hiding children, et cetera. Alienating, you know, yeah. Yeah, so that's basically the web method. And, and it's, it's actually very quickly sometimes within half an hour, an hour of meeting somebody, you start seeing, yep, their words are extreme. I'm feeling either in love with them and after half an hour, um, that's a warning sign. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sad to say, yeah. um, doesn't, I don't say I don't believe in love at first sight, but I don't believe in getting married in the next month. Uh, you wanna wait at least a year because a lot of this stuff does take a while to come out. So I don't disagree that things can be wonderful with somebody, but you also have to use your brain and be cautious. So the web method can help people be cautious. And because we meet so many new people every day, uh, we need to have a little bit of caution about that. And this can help. Yeah, and I just, I, I want to point out that, um, and I, I pointed this out in, in our, our episode with Megan as well. Uh, my best friend is a physician and I was, 
um, shocked to learn when she said to me, you know, the, the term for borderline personality disorder does not mean the borderline between normal and not normal, which I think is what people think. She said it's actually the borderline between neurosis and psychosis, yeah. which is, you know, so you're way down the path. Yeah. <laughs> that point. Well, it, and having dealt with a few people who um, fall into those different personality disorders, the thing that really jumps out at me from the web method is the emotion, what, how I'm feeling, because yeah. that goes back to that, you know, trust your gut. Um, because every time I have had a case with a high conflict personality, or every time I personally have had that person in my life, my gut knew. Yeah. I just didn't listen. Yeah. So you, to me is how many people tell me they got married, even though their gut told them this is a bad idea. And yeah. then a year or two later, they said, you know, I should have paid attention to that. So, well, I, you know, I think part of that is that thing that you said in the beginning, you're the most beautiful person. You're the most amazing thing. I've never had anything like that. And people can be caught up in, in that, the headiness of, of feeling that way. Oh my gosh, I'm like everything to this person or whatever. And then they just don't want to see the bad side because they're so addicted to whatever that good part was. Yeah, you know? it feels really so, great, but you can't just go by feelings. And so I, I caution, trust your gut is pay attention to your gut but also trust your brain. You need to be able to, to use both in making these big decisions. Good point. So you talked, uh, touched a little bit about blame and you, know, you, you also have this thing called target of blame. Yes. And um, that's where they start to ruin your life. Can you tell our listeners a little bit more about that phenomenon? I know that a lot of our listeners have this issue. Yeah. The thing about target of blame, and, and, and often you feel it um, in the relationship, is that you're, the person is preoccupied with blaming you. And so you become their target of blame. It isn't just kind of incidental, it becomes the focus of a lot of their attention. And we see this in relationships, and we also see this in divorce. And so, Someone's, remember, if they're unloading 100% of responsibility onto other people and taking zero themselves, then that means you may be getting 100% of all of this intense energy. And, and people have to realize it takes a certain amount of energy to reflect on yourself and to consider making changes. People with high conflict personalities, and this is the defining piece of high conflict personality is preoccupation with targets of blame, is they put all that energy into blaming other people. And you wonder, where did that energy come from? It came from not looking at themselves. And so the most intense blamers in the world are people that don't have any self-reflection. And so you can see this energy just takes over and it can feel sometimes almost like a question of survival, as this person is just trying to drown me or, or, or whatever. And so it's a characteristic of high conflict personalities. But I wanna mention here the overlap of high conflict personalities and personality disorders is, is there's a lot of overlap. The key is having a target of blame. High conflict personalities have a target of blame, and that's why they end up in court. That's why they end up in high conflict divorces, et cetera. A lot of people with personality disorders don't have a target of blame. I've been a therapist with borderlines, with narcissists, with people with histrionic personality disorder, all of these who don't have a target of blame. They're just distressed. They just kind of blame the universe. They take zero responsibility but they don't focus the blame on one person. So when you see that, and sad to say, our legal system reinforces that. It's a dispute between this person and this person. So you have a plaintiff and a defendant. And so that's what people do. But what's interesting to me is the legal system today, by and large, people are using mediation 
as you folks do, using negotiation. Most people, like 98% of civil disputes, civil legal cases are settled out of court. People don't realize that. What they see on TV is a teeny tiny percent. But the legal process, now that we've got all these alternative dispute resolution measures, the people pouring into the legal process are people who think this way. And so they think like a plaintiff in the world and they see defendants everywhere they go. And so they're getting drawn into the legal system and it just doesn't work because the legal system is an adversarial process of dispute resolution and it's drawing in people that simply have an adversarial process of thinking without resolution. And so it's, it's really a bad fit and people at the receiving end of that really suffer from this, not only this high conflict person, but also the legal system kind of looking at them and the weight of that can be, can be really overwhelming to people. So that's why we all want to educate people and help them work at solving their own disputes as much as possible. So that's yeah. part of the blame. Yeah, don't, don't be one, don't volunteer to be one. Be one. And one of the keys with this is there's, there's four things I want to tell you not to do if you think you're dealing with a high conflict person so you don't become a target of blame. One is don't try to give them insight into themselves. As soon as you say, look at what you're doing, they're going to be defensive and attack you back. The second is don't overemphasize the past. Try to focus on what to do now what to do in the future. Third is don't have emotional confrontations, whether it's angry or tears or whatever, because emotions put these folks into their high conflict frame of mind. And lastly, don't tell them you think they have a personality disorder or you think they have a high conflict personality. Sort of like telling a woman to calm down, right? Yeah. Yeah. Not helpful. Tell all of that. Tell a woman to relax. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, That's that's how to avoid becoming a target of blame. And if you are one, if you use that approach, kind of ease yourself out of that role. You don't want to be, you don't want to invite being somebody. How do you do that? Well, basically staying calm and matter of fact and using the CARS method. And that's in the book. And I know, I know you wanted to talk to me about that. So. Yeah, ab- absolutely. Because I think that is where our listeners can glean the most help. Because the ones who are reaching out to us, they're already in the high conflict divorce process. They are desperate for help. And the help is in five types of people who will ruin your life. You have set out very clear um, methodology to neutralize or manage conflict in those types of situations. And so I did want to definitely hone in on another one of your your acronyms, CARS, C-A-R-S, because I think this is the meat of what people can really pull from to get through this time and and to manage what's going on. So I know that C, let's start with the first letter, (laughs) sounds like a good place, it stands for connecting. So maybe we can do a deep dive into connecting. Yeah, so the idea, and you you said the right word, which is you wanna manage the situation, manage the relationship. Don't make your goal changing the other person because that's, That's all the stuff that backfires. So make your goal managing the relationship, you know, just try to keep it relatively calm. So connecting. And by the way, all four of these are the opposite of what you feel like doing. So when you feel like yelling at them or running the other way is instead connect with them with empathy, attention, and respect. And that's the ear statements that, that you mentioned earlier. And the idea is you just want to have a positive connection. And believe it or not, people with high conflict personalities want to have positive relationships. And so when they're coming at you um, negatively, just respond to them positively as connect. And so empathy, attention, and respect, you can give them some empathy and say, wow, I can see how frustrated you are by this. This is a hard situation. These are big decisions. 
And that's, that's one thing you can do. Another is to say, I'll pay attention. Tell me more. I want to understand your point of view, your proposal, whatever it is. And R is respect, you know. I, I respect your efforts. Um, I respect your time with our child. Um, I respect your preparation for this financial decision. So something has to be true, don't make something up. So something you can respect. Um, I respect, you know, the, the job you did yesterday. That was, that was really helpful. Um, so the idea is, Empathy, attention, and or respect. And so that's, that's a way to connect with people rather than yelling at them to calm down is to also show that yourself as being calm, confident, we can deal with this, uh, you know, let's, let's see what we can do. So it's well, I think with, a lot of times what, what people want to, the, the next, reaction is to get into whatever it is that they're saying like if they say something like you know um for example you had the kids this weekend you didn't feed them anything at all you, you know you starved them blah 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 whatever uh you're a horrible father you know the 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 natural reaction i think for people is to say no this is what i fed them I'm a good dad. Here are all the ways that I'm a good dad. You know, they end up getting into being sucked into that vortex. Yes. Uh, it, it, you know, and so what I used to tell people, or I, I still tell people is, you know, don't respond directly to each and every single allegation. Yeah. Because that's what people, t that's the natural reaction. If you're being attacked, you want to respond to that. Right, but, right. And that's, you know. and that's a mistake. Because <laughs> with high conflict people, now you're in the quicksand with them and you're playing their game and so they're going to win and you're going to lose. So it's much better to sidestep that with an ear statement and connect with them and say, well, thanks for telling me your concerns. You know, I'll, I'll think about that rather than you're wrong, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And it We're doesn't mean the facts are going to change their mind. <laughs> yeah, right. You're not, not going to happen. Mind, but you don't have to agree with them either. So you can say, well, thank you for telling me your concerns. You know, I hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and with that, when we get into the other parts of cars, you might also say, you know, and, and I think I'm doing a fine job and other people have said that too. So, uh, so you don't accept their criticism, but you don't fight with it. It's just, you know, well, we'll just have to agree to disagree on that one, you know, but thanks and uh, have a good week. <laughs> that, that felt a little biffy. <laughs> yeah, right, right. There's, there's overlap in the tone, your statements and, and biff responses. Because sure. you're not fighting with them, you're, you're just keeping it on the positive. Yep. So the A in CAR stands for analyzing, and that involves talking about the choices or options that people have. Um, it, it may sound confusing to our listeners, but it can be effective. And may, um, could you expound on that a little bit? Yeah. Well, first of all, think of the brain, that we have different parts of the brain we respond with. And I tend to, to think in terms of right and left hemispheres, even though the higher parts, higher thinking and lower parts. But ten, generally, right brain thinks more about relationships is where we get more defensive energy. Left brain's more logic, problem solving, et cetera. So connecting with ear calms the right brain. And now you want to focus them on more left brain problem solving. So having choices makes you think. Having to make proposals makes you think. Writing things down makes you think. And so we want to get people thinking. We want to calm them, but then focus them on, on things. And I think just focusing them on a choice, you know, here you've got a choice, you've got alternatives, you know, analyze, decide what you want to do with this choice, gets away from arguing about the past. So here's a combination. So someone 
complains, like you said, the thing about uh, the weekend, you know, so you think I'm a horrible parent and I didn't feed the kids this weekend. So I said, well, okay, thanks for letting me know your point of view. Um, I'll think about that. And let's look in the future to what our choices are, like Wednesday, we've got this uh, baseball game and who's going to go and who's going to be with the child or can I pick up the child or whatever. So you get them focused forward on a choice. And so analyzing is using your analyzing brain, not your reacting brain. So that's connect and then analyze a choice, analyze a proposal, analyze something in writing, get people thinking about really about the future rather than defending the past. So connect and then help analyze. Here's what I see your choices are. And then, you know, then it moves to R, the R in CARS, um, which stands for responding, which, which does take us to BIF, I think, um, which I'm, I'm happy that, that R is uh, responding and, and is BIF because I think uh, that is a method that can help any listener. Um, so could you, could you just expound on that a little bit? Yeah, so R is responding to their hostility or their misinformation without arguing with it. And the easiest way is using BIF responses. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And so BIF is being brief, informative, just straight information, friendly tone, and firm, meaning you end the discussion. You don't say, well, what do you think about that, buddy? You, know, you don't invite a new argument, which so many people do in high conflicts that they can't let go of it. And it's just matter of fact. All of this is calm, confident, matter of fact. Don't look rattled. Um, try to, if you're rattled inside, pretend you're not rattled on the outside because that just escalates the other person. So just keep it calm and that's why writing is so helpful and biff because you can think about it you can go okay i'll send this tomorrow this response so you're not getting stuck in there but it's responding to hostility or uh, misinformation sometimes they'll say something that's not true you know you didn't two weeks ago you were half an hour late and actually you were on time and so you can say you know oh you may not be aware of it, but actually on January 17th, I was on time because I came straight from work. And, and you re may remember that that evening I took the kids to, uh, you know, such and such on time. So, so you're not saying you're wrong. You just say, here's the information. And so have a good weekend. <laughs> and, you know. Well, in situations like that, you also have to really um, notate everything you know keep good records because you will be accused of things like that you didn't show up you know half the time last week or whatever you were late you, you were supposed to call at seven and you didn't you know they will say things like that yeah I, I really agree is keeping keeping records of any potentially controversial event keeping records of parenting time etc doctor's visits, you know, all these kinds of things. It's good because it's people with personality disorders or high conflict people, which a lot of overlap there, uh, tend to distort information. And so they put a spin on it, the all or nothing spin, or they jump to conclusions, or they use emotional reasoning. I feel it's true, so it must be true. And so writing things down is really one of the best ways. And if you do end up in court and you made notes the same day uh, that something happened, you're a lot more credible than if you go, well, yeah, I think last year I did that. Uh, I don't know what day it was. And it's like, hmm, that's pretty fuzzy. So yeah. you write things down the same day that they happen. But we giving, actually, yeah, giving this information is so important. And you can just say, oh, well, my notes say I did pick them up on time that day. Yeah, it was uh, 7, 7 p.m. or 5.30. Um, that's one of the days, you know, that I did it straight from work. So, yeah. And that's, again, you don't say, so you're an idiot and so you're wrong. <laughs> you just say, 
there's the information. You may not be aware of that, but that day, you know, I was on time for these reasons. Yeah, we actually recommend to a lot of our clients um, that they use some of these, the new co-parenting apps um, like FAIR. We had the, the um, Michael Daniels, the creator of FAIR on, and he actually has a, an element to the app um, that allows for checking in. So you can actually use the app to geo-check in to show that you were somewhere at a certain time, but it also allows you to keep records and take notes um, in that contemporaneous fashion and then the reports can just be downloaded for court so there are a lot of ways for these days you know that technology allows people to keep track of a lot of that right right yeah and it I, a lot of arguments and Michael actually developed that part of his app because he was accused of something and um, ended up only being able to prove where he was somewhere because he happened to have a toll receipt because he took a toll road and it had the time stamp on there. And so he was able to prove where he was, but without that, he, he wouldn't have been able to prove it. So he, he developed this part of the app to help others not have to have to deal with that same thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, a lot of what you say is, I think easier said than done for people because they're, they're so emotional. And, yeah. and really what you're saying is, you know, remain calm don't get into the thick of it with them. And when you're being attacked, um, sometimes it can be difficult. So I, I like the S part of your cars because I think it really kind of helps tie up that, that piece of it where, you know, it's, it's so difficult sometimes when you're being attacked um, not to want to respond. So talk about the S and setting limits. Yeah. So setting limits is so common of an issue with high conflict people because they don't stop themselves. Why? That's why they keep going. They don't have the self-restraint. And so individually and as a society, we need to set limits. That's why family courts have become so busy with restraining orders. When I started practicing law in 1993, restraining orders were less, less than 1% of what we spent time on. And now it's, it's a huge part of family law practice. Yes. So stopping people, setting limits, letting them know what they can and can't do, what your consequences will be. If they do this, I'll do that. And so keep in mind, you can't control the other person, but you can say, if you do this, I'm going to have to do that. Or if you don't do this, I won't be able to do this other thing that I've been doing for you. And so it's getting them again to think ahead about the consequences, about the future. So you're saying, I won't participate in it. If you talk to me that way, I'm gonna to have to stop the conversation. I think of, for example, I represented a, a mother who'd been a victim of domestic violence or survivor of domestic violence. And her ex-husband-to-be represented himself and he'd call me up and he'd say now you tell that such and such that we have to do this and this and I'll say you can't talk about my client that way it's very disrespectful and he said, well I'll talk about her any way I want so you tell that such and such and I'll say sorry but if you speak to me that way I'm going to have to hang up and end the conversation so please don't speak about my client that way well I don't care I'm going to do okay, I'm hanging up now, you made your decision, goodbye. And so it's letting people know, you can set personal limits, who you'll talk to, when you'll talk, what topics you'll talk about, all of those things. Now, of course, if you're in a dangerous situation, just get out of the situation. Don't give them ear statements, don't give them choice to get yourself out of the situation. Uh, but most of the time, people can just say, this is what I'm willing to do and what I'm not willing to do. So S is setting limits, letting people know what's okay, what's not okay, but just very briefly. And you can do this with empathy, attention, and respect. You know, I'm, I'm sorry I have to do this, but blah, blah, blah. Actually, that, that violates something else I teach, which don't apologize to angry, upset, high conflict people because then they use it as ammunition. So, what I've tried to do is replace I'm sorry with 
I'm saddened by. And so I'll say, well, sad, I'm saddened by this that I have to say no, but I have to say no to this uh, request that you've made. So you can give them some empathy at the same time that you're setting the limit. I teach judges that. I say, make all the orders you need to make, but tell people, look, you know, I know this is a hard time, and I hope someday you'll appreciate that by stopping this behavior, you're benefiting much more in the long run. That's a great substitution. I like the, it saddens me or it pains yeah. me to do this as opposed to I'm sorry, because I think that is a natural response to say, I'm sorry. To, to, right. to but especially for women, I think yeah. we tend to say sorry more than we should, you know, in situations like that. I mean, or we could, you could even say it's disappointing that yeah. we have to yeah. do this, but. Well, that's a great, know. great point. Yeah. 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 So you don't have to be harsh to set limits. And I, someone suggested one day, and I like this, is think of the Godfather. If you watch Godfather movies, the Godfather is hard to hear because he whispers when he's setting limits. <laughs> and it's like, you know, pretty powerful, pretty dangerous, but it, it's not the volume of your voice. It's how firm and consistent you can be in following through. And that's the other thing is people have to realize you may have to repeat all of the aspects of the CARS method over and over again, and it's okay. Repetition often helps people go, oh, now I get it. You're not willing to talk to me about that subject. Okay. <laughs> So, so another phenomena that, that happens um, that you do discuss in, in the book is what you call negative advocates. Um, yeah. And, you know, I've actually heard this term, the flying monkeys of the narcissists um, yeah. that always brings to get to the wicked witch of the West and, and her right. cadre of monkeys that go after Dorothy. Um, yeah. But many of our listeners are dealing with these collateral people. It's not just always the high conflict personality person. They have their, their, their negative advocates. Um, so can, can you delve into this a little bit? Yeah, it really seems to be part of high conflict people. They collect advocates to speak for them, and they often are family members, but they often also are friends, coworkers, and even professionals. A therapist could get hooked in as a negative advocate. A lawyer could get hooked in as a negative advocate. And usually how you can tell is they're so strong, they're so emotional about they're kind of the knight in shining armor for the person. And what we realize is they're emotionally hooked, but uninformed. And I've seen people like that come to court in, in court cases. And because there's a series of hearings for some of these issues, suddenly they vanish because it's around the time they start realizing the person they've been, been advocating for is actually the person who's engaged in the worst behavior. Um, and partly because of that, they're constantly seeking new negative advocates because the old ones often drop out. Um, but however, I would say in family law, one thing that I see consistently is that the negative advocates in high conflict custody disputes are often the grandparents. And they're often paying for the custody dispute because the parents may have exhausted their funds fighting over everything else. And so it's important for family members to, to be a positive advocate, which means that you provide information, support, but you don't take on the role of fighting for the person. You really can't work harder than the person that's going through the, the divorce. And likewise for professionals, when you find yourself working harder than your clients, there's something wrong. You can't work harder than your clients because then they're not working and you're just be spinning your wheels. So don't become a negative advocate, but don't be surprised if you see them and have to deal with them. And the key to dealing with negative advocates is the same way you deal with high conflict people, connect, help them analyze, respond, set limits but emphasize providing information because they usually are uninformed. And you can say, you may not be aware, but, or aware and, here's some information. 
So that's the way to deal with that. But don't be surprised by it. People are often shocked, like, oh my goodness, they've persuaded this other person in my life to be against me, and now they're attacking me too. How could this happen? And it's well, an emotional yeah. process, and it's because emotions are contagious, and that's why people become negative advocates. Well, and, and also don't be surprised when the negative, when the, when the high conflict personality acts like a high conflict personality. I mean, I had a client one time, two years into litigation, call me up all upset. Can you believe he did this, 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 and this? And you know, this whole thing that happened at the schoolyard that morning or whatever. And I said, yes, I can believe that because I've been hearing about him for two years. I can't believe that you can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so, the behavior doesn't usually scale down as yeah. the litigation process goes on. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Expect them to be that way, but never call them that. Don't say you have a high conflict personality. You're a narcissist. Mm -hmm. You um, are crazy, right? Because... Just have what I call a private working theory. So you can think to yourself, oh, he's narcissistic, therefore I need to do this, this, and this. Rather than, oh, he's a narcissist, so I'm going to call him a narcissist. That doesn't work. Well, yeah, I because the narcissist isn't going to go, oh, you know what? You're right. Yes. <laughs> if that was going to happen, it would have happened 30 years ago. <laughs> right. Well, the, the phenomenon I see so much lately is where perhaps people are not going directly to their ex to say that they think they're a narcissist or a high conflict personality, but they post it all over their social media. My ex is a narcissist, flaming narcissist, and he does this or she yeah. does that and they put it out there, I'm pretty sure it's going to trickle out to their soon-to-be ex. Yeah, um, and it increases their defensiveness and their being difficult. So it's better just, if you say it to anybody, have one person and have them keep it private. Yeah, your therapist would be a good person. That's a yeah, good Yeah, your choice. therapist, yeah. your priest, your rabbi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 So I can't believe our this whole hour went by. I mean, we're we're almost at our end here, and I want to make sure that we get in, you know, where um, the listeners can hear more about you and what books you've got coming up. I know you have one coming out specifically about narcissists. Well, the the, the new book, um, I've taken it a step further. I've gone, you know, into talking about the workplace with it's all your fault at work, and we've gone to dating with dating radar. So this one now is about leaders, and the title is Why We Elect Narcissists and Sociopaths and How We Can Stop. And whether it's to the local school board, the city council, the mayor, the governor, uh, to heads of state and political leaders, uh, we see really same pattern, high conflict personalities, but they collect, we're talking about negative advocates, they collect people who really help them appeal to, to thousands and millions of voters, et cetera. And we're seeing more and more high conflict people get into uh, the political process running for office and people just aren't prepared for them. People don't have the healthy skepticism they need. So it really talks about the patterns of how, what they do to get elected and how we can kind of keep that from happening. So as with high conflict divorce and high conflict in the workplace, um, there's a lot of unhealthy patterns and we have to prepare as a community and as voters to not put them in positions of power. And like I said, it's every level of politics we're seeing high conflict personalities entering nowadays. So we gotta be gotta be a little more wary. And as always, information is helpful. So I really appreciate you giving this opportunity. Uh, but I do have the other books, several divorce books. Susan, I think, described those. Uh, it's all your faults at work, in the workplace. Um, and for, for professionals, I have high conflict people in legal disputes. So a lot of lawyers and law students find that, oh, there it is. I have it. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so I enjoy writing. I enjoy teaching people. And I'm so glad for this chance to uh, educate your listeners. And hopefully they'll 
they'll be a little more calm uh, because they can be, but also it's a better strategy too. Well, that's I, we thank you so much for coming and joining us today because I, I think in this episode, people, or these two episodes, people are going to actually pull out you know, actionable tips that they can put into practice as they go through this very difficult process. I do want to make sure, where can they get the books, Bill? Anywhere. They can go on Amazon, but also unhookedbooks.com has all these books as well. Unhooked books, plural, unhookedbooks.com. I'll be sure to put that. They're e-books, they're audio book. A lot of them are audio books, so it's, it's real easy to find these. Wonderful. Well, thank yes. you so much for joining us today, Bill. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And remember to Biff, Ear, Web, and Cars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful.